Hello there, and welcome to OMED 2020. While this format is much different than past years and will hopefully be a little different in future years, I'm still really grateful for the video options that allow me to communicate with you during what's a really strange time. And more importantly, for you all to gather together and communicate with each other. Thank you for what you're doing, whether your work is academic or clinical, and thank you for spending a few minutes here with me. I'm Melissa Schmidt, director of the JAOA. You may have already heard from Dr. Ross Safant, our new editor-in-chief, about the exciting changes coming to JAOA in 2021. If not, you'll surely hear about them soon. What I'd like to talk to you about today is the academic research cycle. My colleague, Hunter Alexander, who's JAOA's senior publishing editor, will talk to you a bit later about preparing your research for submission and what that looks like at the JAOA. But in this segment, I'm going to give a high-level overview of how clinical questions can, yes, lead to publication, but more importantly, how they arise out of natural, personal patient experiences and how they're part of a larger cycle. What makes osteopathic medicine unique is its focus on whole patient healthcare, and that often means practicing in rural settings. Research isn't just for an academic in a large hospital system. It's for everyone and should be undertaken by everyone, even if it's in a small way. It's how you find out the answers to your own clinical questions and observations and how you ensure the best patient care. We'll have more in-depth videos at jaoa.org on each specific article type. But for now, let's go on a journey where the engine in our car isn't publication, it's curiosity. We'll start at the top with clinical practice observations. Clinical practice observations are often the impetus for a medical research project. These observations come from sources like your own experience, conversations with colleagues and mentors, questions asked by your patients, or even funding patterns like what insurance covers versus what it doesn't. Things that might pique your interest include anomalies, so for example, I've noticed that more of my patients are X than before. I've noticed that fewer of my patients are experiencing Y than before. Z intervention is providing better results than what I was using before. Or like a recent paper we published in the JAOA, I wonder if I could use a portable device to produce results almost as reliable as something more expensive and bulky. Conversely, these clinical observations can also pertain to commonalities. So things you've seen patients frequently present with, ask about, experience a result with, etc. They can also surround new uses for existing therapy. So perhaps something you've been doing for years in a clinical setting and is common knowledge amongst your colleagues, but isn't necessarily noted as a gold standard. With OMT, perhaps you might wonder if a certain treatment traditionally used in one area of the body would be effective in another. Lastly, consider trends and evolutions when you're thinking about your own clinical observations. Perhaps you'd like to begin with a new device or technique in your practice, but you're wondering what experience other clinicians have had with it. Maybe you'd like to begin teaching a home therapy technique to your patients, but you wonder which patients are best candidates for it. All of these are things you might already be curious about on a daily basis without even realizing it. And these questions, these opportunities for increased knowledge and practice improvement are the bedrock of meaningful and relevant research. Once you've identified some areas of curiosity stemming from your clinical practice observations, the next step should be a literature review. Conversations with colleagues are so critical, but looking to the literature for documented outcomes is also really crucial. This can be as simple as reading your preferred medical journals, hopefully JAOA is among them, or searching online to see what comes up just for your own edification. At this point, you'd be looking to determine how common this observation or question was and whether there has already been some documented answer where best practices are clearly defined. Some research cycles might end there because you've easily found what you needed to know in a single spot. If so, that's great, but you've identified an area where the literature is less definitive, your question might deserve a little more research. It's important to note that continued research in this vein may result in a publishable unit, and we'll talk in a little bit of detail about what those might be, but not everything found during a literature review merits publication. So as you're searching the literature, I encourage you to evaluate the following questions. Is it sparse or full? If it's full, complete, and recent, then again, you found what you needed to know. 
Your clinical question has been well covered, so it's time to take what you've learned back to inform your clinical practice. There's nothing additional really to contribute here by publishing. However, if it's sparse, you'll want to look carefully at the dates on the publications you're finding. Are they very fresh? Does this seem like it might be a new diagnostic or therapeutic observation? If so, you might consider fast forwarding or skipping ahead to original research of your own that could contribute to this new area of study. But you might also consider a lit review meant to gather all of the existing research in one place. Next, consider whether the literature is disparate or if that collection has already happened. If it's disparate, you should consider a systematic review where you would gather, appraise, and synthesize all of the previously published material in a single place to provide a hopefully more definitive answer to a well-defined question. The systematic portion, portion refers to how you structure it and how you document that methodology. You should take care to include all of the relevant evidence that meets your criteria, even if it's conflicting. Your systematic review would be a snapshot into the state of the science. If it's already been collected into a systematic review by a researcher before you, perhaps you could consider a meta-analysis, which takes things a step further. In this type of research, you'd combine all of the quantitative data from previously published studies and perform a statistical analysis on it yourself. This would help you and your reader colleagues more accurately assess the strength of the evidence that's out there. This would certainly be publishable, meaning you would submit it for peer review, but again, that's not really the goal. The goal is to find strong evidence to answer the clinical question you started with, whether that's just for you, for your practice group, for your hospital system, or for the world. So what if you find that the literature is outdating or lacking in clinical insight? This is one of the few instances when a narrative review might be appropriate. Narrative reviews, unlike preferred systematic reviews, are often qualitative in their analysis, highlighting only pivotal papers known to the subject expert, rather than approaching the review with a systematic view. The final product is often topical, a general discussion with no particular hypothesis, and often places the literature in context by providing the author's own expert clinical insights. These obviously have natural bias, and that's one of the reasons their contributions to the literature are limited. So returning to the cycle overview, you can see that you've now completed step two, your lit review. Assuming the existing publications haven't quite answered your question fully, it might be time to consider undertaking your own original study. We'll talk about both retrospective and prospective study designs, but I'm going to retrospective first. They often come first in the cycle. So when should you undertake a retrospective study? Consider this model when your own clinical experience might differ from or add to the current data you found during your literature search. When the research question or condition is uncommon and has natural limits on the number of patients you can recruit or review, and in situations where you might already have data at your fingertips in a registry or a repository. So how is a retrospective study done? It's obviously a posteriori, meaning it involves a look back at your patient charts or data. One of the reasons it's a good option when you already have the data gathered. It almost always has case control methodology, meaning you're comparing data from a group of patients with the condi condition or intervention, in other words, the cases, and those who don't have the condition or didn't undergo the intervention, the controls. You must have a predefined outcome, meaning you're not just searching the records to see what pops, and you must have appropriate statistical analysis. This is a good time to plug the importance of two support groups for any researcher. You might think I was referring to family and colleagues, and of course, they're important. But in this case, I'm referencing a statistician and a librarian. These folks can help you with your methodology, your systematic approach, and with defining the appropriate statistical analysis for your particular outcomes measure. This format is ideal to help define the prognostic factors, including risk factors, that later hone your therapeutic approach and or your prospective study. The results will help you figure out how feasible a prospective study even is. So what about the pros and cons of retrospective study? Let's talk about the cons first. These studies are naturally prone to more bias than other formats, including selection and recall bias. There are also limits to what you can learn from a retrospective analysis. You can't truly estimate incidence or risk from it, and if you read a retrospective paper with that claim, the conclusions are overstated. 
That's a really important thing to look out for in your own writing and in the literature you're reading. There is naturally a limited level of evidence, meaning how much credence you can give the data in your clinical decision matrix. And it's also not ideal for analysis of common outcomes. On the other hand, retrospective studies are relatively inexpensive, require smaller study populations, are much faster to complete, and are great at providing a feasibility study of uncommon conditions, as well as epidemiological surveillance. I'm sure we can all see why that's particularly relevant right now. Essentially, they provide some really crucial data groundwork upon which you and other researchers can build. So let's say you've undertaken that retrospective study. Then what? If you find that there are questions still to be answered and you've honed your clinical focus to an area with larger implications and a naturally larger patient population, it might be time to consider that prospective study. I mentioned levels of evidence earlier, and here you can see a level of evidence pyramid from Stony Book Libraries. Below the brown line, I've added everything that we've discussed up to this point. Research that generates case reports, retrospective studies, and lit reviews of those. Above the line are study methodologies that, because of their structure, carry more weight in terms of the evidence you present. They're potentially more informative in terms of your clinical decision making. Prospective studies obviously fall above that line. They contribute more significantly to the knowledge base. As I said, they can take place after the retro ro retrospective excuse me, work has already been completed, which you might have used to establish prognostic factors that guide this study's intervention and outcomes measures. So when should you consider one of these? Opposite to retrospective studies, prospective studies are only feasible when the clinical question involves a common outcome or condition. You must have natural access to a large patient population to make the results meaningful and statistically significant. And you must consult with one of those expert statisticians I mentioned earlier to make sure you've established the appropriate methodology and patient numbers to reach significance before you undertake the study. In other words, you have to know where you're going before you start. Once you know those things, how do you go about it? Systematic reviews almost always have cohort methodology. They can be, but don't have to be randomized controlled trials, but that's outside the scope of this high level overview. They obviously take place a priori, meaning you watch for outcomes during the study period and measure them after the event or exposure, later correlating them to factors like suspected risk. Again, a prospective study must have appropriate statistical methods where the math matches. What are the pros and cons here? Prospective studies are often the gold standard, so it's hard to see what the cons might be. So let's go to those first. They can be expensive and lengthy. Perhaps most daunting of all, they usually require a pretty large patient population. They carry some need for flexibility on the part of the researchers because you may uncover in unanticipated outcomes or be forced to adjust or worse abort. In terms of bias, they're prone to attrition bias and, of course, methods changes over time. But on the plus side, again, they contribute a higher level of evidence than your other options, so you're adding something truly meaningful for you and your colleagues. They can yield true incidence and risk rates if structured properly. There are fewer overall sources of bias. And best of all, because they're a priori, they give you options for studying multiple things at one time. Once you've finished your prospective study, you're almost certainly gonna to wanna to publish the results. So I'll remind you that my colleague Hunter Alexander's OMED presentation is a good resource for that. But when it's done and dusted, what's next? Let's talk about new research questions. This is my favorite part of the cycle because it's where we close the loop and it feeds into a new cycle. I have some background in designing CME, so this portion always makes me think of the needs assessment process. You do a pretest, you offer some education, you do a post-test and the results of the post-test act as a needs assessment for your next pretest because they naturally show you what you still don't know. Ideally, even the results of a definitive prospective study will do the same thing. At this point, you would have made a clinical observation that warranted investigation, done a lit search to see what others have said about it, used those results to perform an original study of either type, and used the results of that original study to identify a new knowledge gap. So then off you go again on the cycle, or your colleagues do. Some of the best research is inspired by the discussion section of past research where the authors talk about what they see as next steps. In terms of potential submissions, each of the steps I just described correlate to a few submission types, including systematic literature review or meta-analysis, a retrospective case control report, which can include brief reports and small case series, then prospective cohort studies, perhaps even with a randomized controlled methodology, 
Again, the details of those are a little beyond the scope of this overview that we're doing together here, but I'm always here to discuss them if you have questions, and I'm sure your colleagues or mentors are too. On that note, here's my contact information. Again, I'm Melissa Schmidt, director of the JAOA, and my email is mschmidt at osteopathic.org. You can also reach the general editorial office mailbox at editorial at jaoa.org. We welcome your submissions, but more than that, we're here to support your career development through every phase, helping you promote and protect the osteopathic profession through research. Thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of OMED.